subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates good morning good afternoon and good evening it took 12 weeks for the world to reach 400,000 cases of covid over the weekend there were more than 400,000 cases across the globe there have now been 11.4 million cases of covid-19 and more than 535,000 lives have been lost the outbreak is accelerating and we have clearly not reached the peak of the pandemic while the number of deaths appears to have leveled off globally in reality some countries have made significant progress in reducing the number of deaths while in other countries deaths are still on the rise where there has been progress in reducing deaths countries have implemented targeted actions towards the most vulnerable groups for example those people living in long term care facilities over the past few months there has been a lot of discussion about the origins of covid-19 all preparations have been finalized and who experts will be traveling to china this weekend to prepare scientific plans with their chinese counterparts for identifying the zoonotic sources of the disease the experts will develop the scope and terms of reference for a who led international mission the mission objective is to advance the understanding of animal hosts for covid-19 and ascertain how the disease jumped between animals and humans who will continue to communicate the latest scientific advances to the media and general public as we have them in this vein who continues to work with technology companies to make sure people have access to accurate health information and resources on covid-19 today i'm pleased to announce that we have partnered with facebook and preclet.org to provide who's covid-19 information in free basics and discover in a mobile friendly format through this collaboration we will reach some of the most vulnerable people who will be able to access life saving health information without any data charges in more than 50 countries we have launched this product in english french spanish and arabic and other languages will follow in the coming weeks furthermore i want to thank google for its continued support and dedication to keep the global community safe and informed and for its recently increased ad grant to who this support enables us to catch trending falsehoods early respond to them quickly and give people better access to life saving information when they need it most wherever they are in the world this pandemic has shown the importance of being able to see each other online while being physically apart and 20 years on from the Durban AIDS conference a game changing moment in the fight against hiv leaders policy makers scientists activists and civil society are assembling virtually this week for aids 2020 who is deeply concerned about the impact of covid-19 on the global response to hiv A new WHO survey showed access to HIV medicines has been significantly curtailed as a result of the pandemic. 73 countries have reported that they are at risk of stock outs of antiretroviral medicines ARVs. To mitigate the impact of the pandemic on treatment access, WHO recommends all countries prescribe ARVs for longer periods of time. up to 6 months while supply chains for all medicines are fully functioning similarly 
shortages of condoms and pre-exposure prophylaxis can prove costly, and WHO calls for countries to ensure an interrupted prevention, testing, and treatment services for HIV. The disruptions in access to life-saving commodities and services come at a critical moment as progress in the global response to HIV stalls. Over the last two years, numbers of new HIV infections stabilized at 1.7 million annually, and there was only a modest reduction in AIDS-related deaths. More than 25 million people now have access to ARVs, but global targets for prevention, testing, and treatment are off target. Progress is stalling because HIV prevention and testing services are not reaching the groups that need them most. And the lack of optimal HIV medicines with suitable pediatric formulations has been a long-standing barrier to improving health outcomes for children living with HIV. Going forward, access to services for vulnerable groups must be expanded through stronger community engagement, improved service delivery, and tackling stigma and discrimination. 20 years ago, Nelson Mandela closed the AIDS conference by saying, I quote, this is, as I understand it, a gathering of human beings concerned about turning around one of the greatest threats of, of humankind has, has faced. I will repeat, I quote, this is, as I understand it, a gathering of human beings concerned about turning around one of the greatest threats humankind has faced, end of quote. Those words from Madiba echoed through a generation of activists and policymakers alike, and I say them today as a message to the world. More than six months in, the case for national unity and global solidarity is undeniable. To beat the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure that essential health services for diseases like HIV continue, we cannot afford any divisions. I will say it again. National unity and global solidarity are important more than ever before to defeat a common enemy, a virus that has taken the world hostage. This is our only road out of this pandemic. I repeat, national unity and solidarity. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. We'll now open the floor to questions. I would, there are hundreds, many, many of you with your hands up. So I would remind you one question each. Please keep it short. Say your name and where you're from. And when I call on you, please remember to unmute yourself, then go ahead. So our first question is from Christine Theodorou from ABC Network USA. Christine, you have the floor. Please go ahead. Hi, I wanted to ask about the New York Times report previewing an open letter to be published by 239 scientists from around the world calling for the WHO to give greater acknowledgement to the risk of an airborne spread of COVID-19. Um, first of all, I wanted to get your reaction to those reports and to see what where WHO's research stands in terms of what um, where we are. Thank you for your question. Uh, so we have discussed and collaborated uh, with many of the signatories of uh, the articles uh, that you have uh, mentioned over the last few months. Uh, and indeed, uh, we discussed the available evidence that has been discussed in these pieces. And also, uh, we received uh, contributions from uh, many of, of the signatories of these pieces. 
Um, we acknowledge that uh, there is uh, emerging evidence in this field, as in all other fields, uh, regarding the COVID-19 uh, virus and, and pandemic. Um, and therefore, uh, we believe that we have to be open uh, to this evidence and understand its implications regarding the modes of transmission and also regarding the precautions uh, that uh, uh, need to be taken. Uh, would you like to add something, Maria? Or just to say, um, thank you, Benedetta. Just to say that, yes, um, you know, we have been engaged with this group since April. Uh, when they first wrote to us on April 1st. Um, and we've had an active engagement with them and with many of the signatories on this through, through different networks. Um, and as uh, uh, we have said previously, we welcome the interaction from scientists all over the world from many different disciplines. Um, many of the signatories are engineers, uh, which is a wonderful area of expertise, which, which adds to growing knowledge about the importance of ventilation, which we feel also is, is very important. Um, we have been talking about the possibility of, of airborne transmission and aerosol transmission as one of the modes of, of transmission of um, COVID-19, um, as well as droplet. We've looked at fomites, we look at fecal oral, we look at mother to child, we look at animal to human, of course, as well. And so we are, are producing um, a scientific brief on summarizing where we are. We've been working on this for several weeks now, uh, and we've engaged with a large number of groups, um, epidemiologists and clinicians, IPC specialists, engineers, mathematical modelers, to try to consolidate the growing knowledge around, around transmission. Um, but we have uh, spoken about the, the importance of all of the different potential modes of transmission. Um, this is a respiratory pathogen, um, and so it is important that what we know fits into the guidance that we have, which is why a comprehensive package of interventions are required to be able to stop transmission. This includes not only um, physical distancing, it includes the use of masks where appropriate in certain settings, specifically where you can't do physical distancing, um, and especially for healthcare workers. So our focus on, on the use of masks, of course, is for healthcare workers, um, and to use airborne precautions where you have those aerosol generating procedures, but we're also looking at the possible role of airborne transmission in other settings where you have particularly closed settings where you have poor ventilation. So uh, we will be issuing our brief in, in the coming days, um, and that will outline everything that we have in this area. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zaligranzi and Van Kerkhoff. Uh, the next uh, journalist with a question is Jeremy Lange of AirFA. Jeremy, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Go ahead, please. Thanks. I will ask my question in French, if I may. Um, it's kind of a follow-up of the, the previous question. Um, sur on the study that's talking about aerosol or transmission by air, shouldn't be we worried from the fact that the WHO has suspended its tests on hydrochloric oxide after the Lancet test and then uh, backpedaled on that the WHO went out on a limb on that. But the uh, subject of uh, transmission by air, uh, the WHO also gave recommendations here very quickly. And we know that it's the summer and we have air conditioning running full blast in many places. Tell me, as Dr. Alagranzi will answer your question. Uh, so I'll answer in, in English if it's okay. Um, so, first of all, uh, I would like to highlight that we encouraged and supported research in this field as well. You highlighted the hydroxychloroquine or the treatments field of research, uh, but we have supported uh, research in this field as well. And indeed, uh, last week, as you may remember, we held uh, an international uh, research meeting where there were active discussions on uh, uh, infection prevention and control and modes of transmission. And uh, our group, together with the experts uh, who are part of it, uh, really highlighted 
the importance of um, research in the field of uh, different transmission routes uh, and in particular uh, through uh, droplets of different sizes um, and understanding really what is the relative importance of this. Um, and uh, uh, also understanding um, the uh, dose of, uh, of the virus that is needed, in particular in this uh, route of transmission, uh, that is the aerosol or airborne transmission. Uh, so these are fields of research that are really growing and for which uh, there is some evidence emerging but is not def definitive. Um, and therefore, uh, the possibility of airborne transmission in, um, in public settings, uh, uh, especially in very specific conditions, uh, uh, crowded, closed, uh, poorly ventilated settings uh, that have been described cannot be ruled out. Um, however, uh, the, the evidence needs to be gathered and interpreted, and we continue to support this. Regarding uh, the uh, measures that you were talking about, uh, yes, indeed, we do recommend a number of measures uh, like uh, uh, those mentioned my, by my colleague uh, before, which take into consideration uh, this possibility. In several of our guidance documents, we do recommend uh, as much as possible avoiding uh, closed uh, settings and crowded uh, situations. Uh, we do recommend um, appropriate and optimal ventilations of indoor environments um, and also uh, physical distancing, as you know, uh, and when this is not possible uh, in areas with uh, uh, community transmission of the virus, we recommend the use of face masks, in particular fabric, uh, no medical masks uh, for uh, the public. So. All of this is taken into consideration in our recommendations, as um, we previously said. So if I could just add to that, um, and just to say a few words about how WHO does its normative work, the guidelines and the standards and the recommendations that we make are based on a, a process that we've had now, well established, and of course, we're constantly improving that process. We're constantly looking for innovations and how we can do better. And when you're in an emergency situation like we are, and when the science is constantly changing on a daily basis almost, you know, we review uh, some days up to 1,000 publications. The average is about 500 new publications a day. So there's a huge amount of, of new data that's being put out. Not all of it is of good quality. It needs to go through peer review. <coughs> And that takes time, but we look at preprints and we look at peer-reviewed publications. We do what's called a systematic review of the evidence. Um, it's also sometimes called a meta-analysis. When you have a large number of studies, you put them together and have a statistical method of, of trying to see where the evidence is, uh, is pointing, in which direction. And as you know, every study that comes out is not always in agreement with the previous one. That's how science evolves, till you get a body of, of data. So, so you have bioengineers and, and experts in physics who do experiments in laboratories and, and, and come out with, with that kind of data. Now, whether that exactly reflects what happens in day-to-day -day settings and clinical settings, we cannot extrapolate, right? So you, then you have to take ecological uh, descriptive data sometimes from outbreaks that happen in different settings, which may point in a certain direction, but then you cannot always rule out. For example, it may point to the fact that there, there could have been limited airborne transmission, but it could also be through fomites or other means. And so there's, the body of evidence continues to, to grow, and we adapt, and so we do what's called a living systematic review. Every week we update the review based on the latest, and there are hundreds of publications now in the area of transmission. And then we have what's called a guideline development group that considers all of this evidence and many of the scientists uh, who are authors of that, some of the scientists who are authors on that letter are part of our expert groups and guideline development groups. And um, they then look at the evidence and then they have to make a considered recommendation. 
uh, and we take this very seriously. We are, of course, uh, focused on, on public health guidance, uh, and so any guidance that we put out has implications, of course, for, for billions of people uh, around the world. So it's, it has to be carefully considered uh, before it is done. So we want to be uh, as fast as possible and, and adaptive and responding to the new evidence, and at the same time, we have to consider the, the, the weight of the evidence. And, and you mentioned hydroxychloroquine, so very quickly, I think, because we don't want to um, the reason that we interrupted that trial was because of safety of participants was in question because of a publication, which later was withdrawn. But we cannot take a, a chance, we cannot take a risk with safety of people who are in a clinical trial. And so within a week when it was clear that, that there wasn't that evidence, the, the study then restarted. And as you know, you may know, we, we completed the hydroxychloroquine arm and because there's enough evidence now to show that it does not have any impact on mortality in hospitalized patients with COVID. So just wanted to give you an idea of how, how WHO actually makes guidance. And it's, it's not impulsive. It's not done on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's a process that continues and will continue, I'm sure, with COVID uh, for the weeks and months to come. Thank you very much for those comprehensive answers. Uh, we now have a question from Bianca Rossier from Globo, Brazil. Bianca, please go ahead. Hi, Margaret. Can you hear me? Very well. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot. Yeah, the Brazilian President Jay Bolsonaro Bolsonaro just announced that he tested positive for coronavirus. And as you know, in the last months, we have seen him calling COVID-19 a small flu, ignoring the use of masks and also criticizing social distancing measures. We would like to hear from the WHO how important is it that the leaders set an example to the population in the fight against the pandemic? And how dangerous is that Brazilians feel lost in the middle of a crisis like this one? Um, I, I'm sure Dr. Tedros will speak to this, but we certainly um, uh, wish Mr. Bolsonaro uh, very well and we wish him a, a, a speedy and full recovery uh, from, from this disease. Uh, other leaders around the world have, have, have had uh, similar experiences. Um, I think it brings home for us all the, the reality of this virus. Uh, and uh, n no one uh, uh, is, is special in that regard. We're all potentially exposed to this virus. The virus doesn't really know who we are, uh, whether we're prince or pauper, uh, we're equally vulnerable. And I think what it really highlights is our collective vulnerability to this disease. So we wish Mr. Bolsonaro and his family uh, the best in this regard. Uh, it is a time in any uh, uh, Brazil is, a, is a, a great nation that faces a, a, difficult, uh, a difficult task and a difficult time. Um, <clears throat> uh, the numbers in Brazil um, have stabilized uh, over uh, the last uh, number of days, and certainly the reproductive number across many of the states, uh, while it still hovers above one, um, it, it has moved down. Um, the, uh, however, the hospital system still remains uh, uh, under some pressure, and while it is still coping, and again with great uh, regard to the skill and commitment of health workers all over Brazil, but uh, hospital occupancy and ICU bed occupancy is, is still coping, but it's, it's in, in many cases near critical. <clears throat> so Brazil faces uh, many of those challenges. Uh, we hope, as I've said here previously, that uh, Brazil can continue to develop and deliver the response at federal, state and at local level, that we see the, the unity of purpose and the sustained application of the comprehensive strategy that we have advocated uh, for, for, for a very, very long time. Uh, and we trust that if Brazil can bring all of its um, uh, health system, public health system, uh, and its communities together, that Brazil can continue to make pro progress in the face of this disease. But I think the message to us all is we are all vulnerable to this virus. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think Mike, Mike, Mike has said it all. Um, 
we, we, we have been saying for a long time now, uh, including at the early stages of the pandemic, uh, that this virus is very dangerous. And uh, we called it many times public enemy number one. This is early days. Um, it has two dangerous combinations. One, it moves fast, and also it's a killer. Uh, and that's why we were um, um, worried and warning the world continuously. So, as, as, as Mike said, I think we are all vulnerable. And that's why we also say this is an enemy against humanity, that humanity should stand in unison uh, to fight, to fight and defeat it. Uh, this happens <laughs> once in a century. It's a dangerous virus. None like this has been seen since the since 1918. And national unity, I said it in my speech, and global solidarity are the most important. And without which, without which, and without which, I don't think we can defeat this virus. And the divisions actually will be advantage to the virus. And not only Brazil, the whole Latin America doesn't look good. Cases are on the rise, deaths are on the rise. And even North America, Mesoamerica, except Canada, Canada is doing better. Uh, we're concerned. And in the rest of the world, although I said the deaths are leveling off uh, because some countries are showing some progress, uh, but many countries are actually um, having more cases and deaths are on the rise. So it's very important to understand the seriousness of this, this virus and to be really serious. No country is immune and no country is safe and no individual can be safe. But having said this, we wish His Excellency uh, the President well and we wish him fast recovery And I hope I hope uh, the, uh, the symptoms will be mild, and His Excellency will be back back to office as soon as uh, possible uh, to support uh, his country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, for those supportive words and. We do know we are all vulnerable. We have a journalist on the line trying to get through, Kamran Kazimov, who has been trying to call us from his hospital bed because he in Azerbaijan has also been diagnosed with COVID. Everyone is vulnerable. Uh, I will ask his question for him later if, we, if he can't get through. But we will now go to Imogen Fuchs uh, from the BBC. Imogen, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, thank you for, for my question. It is to do with um, the the death rate, because I think on Friday, Dr. Tedros, you said that the, the death rate peaked in April. And since then, we have millions of more cases. And I know you said the death rate is still rising in some countries, but it isn't in others, which, which still have a heavy burden of cases. Could you kind of break it down a bit more for us, what you attribute that to? Is it the age of the people who are getting the virus? Is it that clinicians have developed a better, uh, better way of treating? What 
Cheers. Imogen, you cut, broke up. Did you get the? Can you repeat the last? It was okay. It, it just is it, is it clinicians have developed a better way of treating it. They know more about it. I'm just I'm interested in a breakdown of why the the, the death rate isn't rising as fast as the cases. Thank you. Thank you. About the test, I will, I will give it to my colleagues to say more. But when I said last time about the peak in April, um, it was uh, about Sweden, actually. It peaked the week of April uh, 20. And ever since, uh, the number of deaths in Sweden actually has been on the decline. Uh, of course, the number of cases has been on the increase even until uh, the week of June 22 in, in, in Sweden. And I said, of course, uh, we worry about increased number of cases, but more important is, you know, watching on the number of deaths. Even if the number of cases increase, if we manage to reduce uh, the number of deaths, that would be very uh, important. And that's why I cited uh, Sweden as an example. And there are other countries whose death rate is actually on the decline. And that's why overall death, death number of deaths globally has actually leveled off. But that doesn't mean that it's a success because the leveling off of number of deaths globally is because of some countries. But in many countries, it's on the rise. And that's why we said, even if the number of cases are increasing, we have to focus especially on the number of deaths, and we need to have targeted approach to reduce the number of deaths. And many countries have found that the deaths are disproportionately higher in uh, older age, age, age groups and other vulnerable groups. And when they started their targeted approach, especially in long-term uh, facilities, uh, the uh, deaths started to decline. So that focused approach will be very important, and that's what we're, uh, we're suggesting based on the experience from uh, countries that manage to lower deaths like Sweden. But another example is, I think we have said it before, um, Japan, even though the number of cases uh, were high, especially at the in initial stage of the uh, pandemic, but the number of deaths were kept, kept really low. And this was because Japan was focused in uh, targeted uh, intervention uh, to save lives, and many countries uh, can follow uh, that targeted approach, which can help uh, to keep the death rates low. And the April um, uh, peak, which I said was about Sweden, which ever since has actually uh, declined in, in, in Sweden. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, just as a general rule of thumb, if you go back to uh, April, we were probably average around uh, 6,000 deaths per day globally, and that sort of stayed uh, pretty steady and has dropped in sort of mid-May to around 5,000 deaths per day, and it's gone up and down slightly around that number, and it's, it's kind of stayed very steady, as the DG has said, overall. But within that, there are countries with increasing deaths and countries with decreasing deaths. What has happened, though, at the same time, if you imagine, again, back in April, we were around 80,000 uh, cases a day, 6,000 uh, uh, 6, deaths in, in March, uh, uh, about 180 to 100,000 cases, uh, and again, around uh, five to 6,000 deaths. And then in May, um, uh, into, into beginning of June, very similar. But what we've seen in the month of June is an acceleration in the number of cases. And what hasn't accelerated with that yet are the number of deaths. 
but we know it takes time and there is a lag phase in that. So some of this may be lag. We may see deaths start to climb again because we've only really experienced this rapid increase in cases over the last five to six weeks. So we may see that. So I, I don't think it should be a surprise if the deaths start to rise again. It would be very unfortunate, but it may happen. Um, there is an element, uh, certainly, of better care. And again, doctors and nurses and physicians have really learned how to better manage this case. Simple stuff from oxygen therapy to prone therapy, managing patients, uh, picking out those patients who are likely to deteriorate more rapidly um, uh, by looking at uh, oxygen levels in the blood. So essentially managing the clinical pathways so the patients most likely to get very sick get into the highest form of care quickly so the, the clinical pathway has been managed more effectively has probably had a, an impact on the overall uh, number of deaths. Certainly some of the therapies that have become available uh, may also have reduced death rates. We've seen the likes of dexamethasone and others that have um, reduced uh, the number of deaths in very severe patients um, and, and a number of those factors. There's also the, the testing uh, factor. As testing has increased, the proportion of people maybe in younger age groups who are being detected that were not detected before has increased, so the overall number of fatalities is a smaller proportion of the overall number of cases. That certainly has some impact uh, on, on, on that, but we would expect the proportion of positive cases as a total as of the total number of cases to drop at the same time, which has happened in many places. So you're right, Imogen, it is a it is a complex series of factors. What's good is that the death rate is stable. Uh, it may increase. We would hope to be able to collectively uh, drive that down. What is a concern is the fact that the disease uh, numbers are increasing uh, day by day. And if you imagine that somewhere in April and May we were dealing with 100,000 cases a day, today we're dealing with 200,000 cases a day. Uh, and that is not purely as a result of testing. This epidemic is accelerating, um, and we're lucky. Uh, I hope part of it is that we've become better, uh, and there is a difference between being good and being lucky. Uh, I would prefer to be both good and lucky. Uh, and, uh, but I do think uh, a lot, some of this, at least, is down to some excellent frontline doctors and nurses and their ability to detect and treat patients early. Um, and we hope we can continue to provide them with the support they need to keep pushing that curve down. Some of it is also due to shielding and protection of older populations who uh, I think we've learned uh, all of us collectively, that underlying conditions, that people in long-term care facilities are particularly at risk, and therefore shielding and protecting more vulnerable people and ensuring that they're not infected or don't get infected may also reduce in a reduction in the overall number of deaths. Maria? Thank you, DG. Just, to, just a, a, um, a quick note to say that while we're talking about this in general, there are quite some differences by countries. And we've spoken many times about um, the challenges of comparing mortality by country because there are so many factors that could be associated with these differences. Um, and just calculating mortality, or we're looking at deaths over time, de reported deaths over time. Um, and if you look at deaths by million population or if you look at a crude case fatality ratio, there are challenges with all of these estimates, um, which ca could have to do with the surveillance strategies and testing strategies of finding cases, um, have to do with access to care, early care, um, access to oxygen, um, et cetera. And, and of course, we are learning and, and frontline workers are learning how to care better for patients. Um, but it also uh, is affected by the populations that are affected. We've seen in some countries the majority of the deaths are due to cases that are identified in long-term living facilities. This, is a, this has been a tragic um, aspect of this pandemic um, and something that can be um, tackled and something that we could focus on and make sure that we reduce, we prevent the opportunity to enter into these vulnerable populations. Um, and then to, just to add that some countries will be revising the, the deaths um, as they go forward and looking at um, attributing deaths to COVID directly, indirectly, um, and whatnot. And, and there are systems in place in Europe, for example, the Euromomo program, which is looking at excess mortality across Europe. And there's other systems in place in other parts. So it will take us some time to really understand mortality. Um, but having said that, there are many things that we can do now to prevent infections. 
and by preventing infections, we are ultimately preventing the opportunity for someone to advance to severe disease and death. So this, this is a major focus of ours and all of the member states to do as much as we can, as quickly as we can, uh, to reduce mortality um, where possible. DG. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to add a, more, a few, few things. Uh, one, uh, what we're saying is the number of cases is on the increase. It's actually accelerating very, very fast, and I, I have already provided the figures. But it's still positive. It's still possible by using the comprehensive approach to uh, minimize transmission, and we have to focus on that. But what we're saying is we have to be even more focused and we have to do more uh, to save lives, to minimize mortality. And many countries are doing that and that's why it's leveling off and we have to invest on that. But one more thing I would like to say is uh, on the Americas, I'd like to say that especially the Caribbean countries are doing very well, both in terms of suppressing transmission and also in terms of uh, uh, saving, uh, saving lives. But not only the Caribbean, uh, the Pacific uh, countries uh, are also uh, do, doing, uh, doing well. And there are some uh, positive uh, or good uh, progress in some parts of the world too. But overall, uh, we're really uh, concerned, as I said earlier. Thank you very much. That question stimulated a really rich discussion. Uh, we're running out of time. I'm sorry, you've, there are so many of you on the line, but we've only got time for, for two more questions. So I'll now go to Kai Kupferschmidt. Thanks. Um, thanks for taking my question. I was wondering, um, just to go back to the announcement um, of the, the, you know, uh, sorry, scouting team to go to China for the um, look at zoonotic transmission. Can you give a little bit of an idea of what are the kind of things that you would hope to achieve there? What are the kind of things that you would hope you can look at? Would you be trying to go to, you know, um, industrialized farming, you know, really try to, to, to get a sense of the, um, the, the animal-human interface that might exist? Or are you going to concentrate on Wuhan where the first cases were? I realize that all of this is part of what you want to decide in that um, advanced mission, but I'm just curious what you hope to get out of it. Yeah. Thanks, Kai. Uh, and and uh, I, I know you follow these uh, issues quite closely over time. And I think, first of all, uh, you and many scientific journalists know that the, the, the answers on these questions are, 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 are sometimes elusive, and it is quite a detective story to find the, the, the source and the intermediate pathways by which the virus can, uh, can breach that barrier to humans. We spent decades trying to do that in Ebola. We spent years trying to do that with MERS and SARS. It takes time, and it does take a meticulous, multi-sectoral approach to this. So there is the wild animal kingdom, there is the farmed animal kingdom, then there are the interfaces with humans. Those interfaces with humans can occur with wild animals, they can occur on farms, they can occur in markets, and we don't know where that species barrier was actually breached. Uh, um, and, I, and I think our colleagues in, in China are, are, and our scientific colleagues are, are equally anxious to, to find answers to that, because th this is very important. Because unless we understand, like anything, if, 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 if the walls of your castle are breached, you need to know where the breach is because you can fix uh, and repair that breach. You can make sure that that is strengthened for the future. So we need to understand what was the, the track of this virus from the wild animal kingdom uh, directly into humans, directly through farmed animals, directly into a market, one market, two, how many? So understanding that, uh, that story, understanding that uh, the narrative and the pathway by which this virus entered the human population is extremely important. But it's not always a straightforward process of being able to get that answer. And I know that sounds obtuse, but there are many dead ends when you study these things. And I've, you know, we've seen that, as I said, we, we, we spent many years trying to look at the source for Ebola and the intermediate hosts. And we still, even in Ebola, 
have difficulties with the intermediate host. We understand that the primary host is in Bath, but then there are many potential intermediate hosts that have been, uh, have been uh, and Maria can speak to MERS and SARS and many other diseases for which she has a, a deep experience. Um, I do think, though, when we, and we will be working very closely, as we did in previous missions with Chinese colleagues, number one, the, the, there is a, a, both the Ministry of Science and Technology, the Ministry of Health will be involved in this, and uh, we look forward to a deep engagement with them, uh, with the scientific community in China, first of all, to set out what the approach will be, what investigations need to be carried out, where do these investigations need to be carried out, what data should be collected, uh, and what, f uh, what data is already available, because very often in these situations, some of the data is there already. You need to look at that data, what's available, then you need to decide, is that enough data to make a determination, both epidemiologic data, laboratory data, animal data, and then you decide, based on that data, whether further investigations are needed and where those investigations are needed. And needed. And Tedros has often said to me, the the, those sorts of investigations lead where they lead. There is a trail and we have to follow that. Uh, but the best place to start is, is clearly uh, in, 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 in where the disease emerged in humans first and where the disease emerged in humans uh, first, where the first clusters of atypical pneumonia occurred were in Wuhan. So that is the best starting point for an investigation of the, of the animal origin. But after that, I think we have to keep an open mind. Science must stay open to all possibilities, and therefore we need to lay out a series of investigations that will get the answers that I'm sure the Chinese government, governments around the world, and ourselves really need in order to manage the risk going forward into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, by the way, when we say um, a team is going for the preparations to China, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, China has not been researching on this. It doesn't mean that we will be starting from, from scratch. Um, because uh, there is uh, capacity, actually, in China to do, to do research. So as Mike said, we will pick up from uh, what's already, already uh, done. And the planning of this uh, team that's going to be going for the planning with its counterparts will, of course, consider what has been done uh, so far. So we shouldn't consider as if there was no uh, movement or no activity uh, until now. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I said, we were trying to get through to camera and cuss him off, but unfortunately we have not been able to get him. So we wish him well and wish him to, as everyone else who's fighting this virus. And I'll just ha and there is also an important press conference on HIV starting now. So I'll just hand it over to Dr. Tedros for final words. Ah, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Margaret, and thank you also to all those who have uh, joined on, on online. And look forward to seeing you on uh, Friday. Thank you so much. <laughs>